Who is Jesus Christ to you? Is he just a, the most important Bible character of 2,000 years ago? Or is he a real person who is your friend? See, that was a question that was asked Jesus by Jesus himself. Who do you say I am? Of course, you've heard some thought Elijah, some John the Baptist, some a prophet. But Peter said, you are the Christ. And Jesus told him, well, to be quiet about it. He went on to say that he was going to suffer. It's interesting that many times Jesus told his people that he was going to suffer, but they still didn't believe it. He told them that he would even die and be raised again in three days. But Peter didn't like that. Can you imagine? He rebuked Jesus. Jesus turned to him and said a very shocking thing. Get behind me, Satan. Can you imagine Jesus calling one of his followers Satan? He wasn't calling him the devil, but Satan actually means adversary. So what Jesus was actually saying to him is, you're really resisting what I'm trying to tell you. Today, we would call that denial. Could it be that maybe even some of us are in denial because we can only see things from a human perspective, just as Peter was only looking from a human perspective? Perhaps of all the questions that we could ask ourselves in our lives is, what does Jesus Christ mean to us? You see, it's becoming more and more apparent in America that people have a lot of different ideas about that. 78% of Americans, according to Barnes' study, identify, them, identify themselves as being Christian. But when we look at the behavior and the lifestyle and the actions of most of Americans, we must say they're not consistent with the teachings of Jesus. Why is there so much corruption, so much blatant sin and strife between people? Could it be that they love the idea of being a Christian, but they really aren't committed to following what Jesus says? Jesus himself indicated that maybe it wasn't as easy as people think to follow him. When he said, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. But those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Jesus wasn't saying it's hard necessarily to become a Christian, but what he was saying, it's narrow and it's hard because there's only one way and that is through faith in Jesus himself. And most people aren't willing to follow him. I think it's fairly safe to assume that most people don't have a clear idea what it means to be a Christian. Too many of us are relying on an emotional experience, maybe a, a conversion experience that we may have called it at one time where we felt really compelled by the love of God and, and we want to make sure that we went to heaven. Others may just think of it only as a lifestyle. Others may think about it as one to whom we can pray. Now the Bible calls Jesus' followers the bride of Christ. Inherent in that is an understanding of an intimate relationship, a closeness, a oneness, because marriage involves a oneness between two people. Now Jim Peterson, in his book called The Living Proof, said there's three elements of the human personality that are involved in making decisions in, in becoming a Christian. They're the emotions, the intellect, and the will. And he uses marriage as an example. And this is how most relationships start. They start on the emotional level. 
You see someone, you're attracted to them, you have strong feelings and you get very excited about living in a close relationship. And man, you want to run off and, hey, that's getting married. But then you do take a little while to think about some things. You ask yourself some serious questions. Well, how are we going to get along? How are we going to support each other? Where are we going to live? What's it going to be like to have another person in the home? And so they spend more time together, getting better acquainted. Eventually, each decides that the other one's a pretty good risk, and maybe that's a good idea. They like what they found. But the final and the heaviest vote of all is when they decide to make a choice. It's called the will. Am I willing to give up my freedom for this person? Am I really ready to assume responsibilities that come with marriage? Am I willing to commit? And that's the way it is in coming with Christ. We have emotional response to Jesus, love for us. We have understanding of the great story of the gospel. But we also must decide that he is the one that I want to commit my life to. Now in our text this morning, there are two important questions that we need to answer. What must I know to be a follower of Jesus? People may have a lot of different things, but the first thing we need to understand is who Jesus is. See, the people of that day when Jesus asked that question, we're just like they are today. There was speculation, there was understanding, there was projection. Some thought he was a good leader. Some thought he was a religious leader. Some thought he was a man of peace. And that, those ideas are still here today. But Peter came right to the core of the issue. He said, you are the Christ. What does that mean? Christ means the anointed one or the chosen one. And for centuries in the idea of the Jewish heritage, there was a clear idea that the Christ would be the Messiah, the one who would come to save his people, the one who would lead them out of all of their problems. He would be the Messiah. See, even the Jewish leaders understood this because they asked him, are you the Christ? the son of the blessed, and this is in Mark, the fourth, 14th chapter. And Jesus said, I am. See, it's not enough to believe that Jesus is a good man or a great humanitarian. He wants us to know him as Christ, the anointed son of God, who is our personal savior. And this involves a personal relationship with him. Remember that Jesus said to the five virgins who came to the door who weren't ready and they were knocking on the door? He said, I never knew you. Salvation is a very personal thing. It's not a theory. It's a reality. It's not a philosophy. It's a relationship. It is a connection with Jesus. Jesus wanted his disciples to know that he would take on the results of sin and die a sacrificial death. So God in love gave up his own son as a sacrifice. Paul explained this later in the book, uh, second letter of the Corinthians. For he hath made him to be sin for us, that who knew no sin, that he might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus is our life giver. He saves us for eternity, but he is also giving his life for us now that we might live with him in dwelling in our hearts and minds. Peter just couldn't understand this idea. He, he was looking only on the outward appearances, but Jesus was offering more than a victory over the Romans. He was offering a victory over Satan and over sin itself. Peter had the idea that he would be a, a cabinet member, but Jesus wanted more than that. 
Jesus wanted Peter to share the good news of salvation. Later, Peter would understand this. And in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, he says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus, of Christ, the Lamb, without blemish and without spot. He understood God's plan to restore us to a full relationship with him. Now, hundreds of years before Christ's birth, the prophet Isaiah described what it would happen with this Messiah. He said, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And yet, nobody caught that. They didn't apply it to God. They were expecting physical deliverance from an enemy. The Bible tells us that indeed, suffering is part of loving. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. And that's exactly what Jesus did. My heart was deeply moved. Last week when we heard the story of the shootings in Florida, two teachers, Aaron Fleiss and Scott Beagle, laid down their lives to protect their students. Jesus has done that for each one of us. As it were, he took the bullet. He died in our place. So to be a Christian is to understand who Jesus is and not just a good man, but he is God, the God man who came down to love, to redeem, to bring us back into relationship with him. He came and suffered and bled and died. And he paid that price. And he's given us the ticket, as it were, of restoration. And he's also offering us his life. His life means that he is offering us the, his presence and his power to come into our lives to, to help us, to show us, to make godliness a part of how we live. That second question that we find in this is, what must I do to follow Jesus? And Jesus made it very clear. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Jesus was saying, there is a price. And he wasn't saying that you have to be doing something to achieve it, but what he was saying is, be willing to follow in my footsteps. Be willing to live the life that I'm going to give you. There's a man named Kenneth Clark. He's internationally known for his television series called Civilization. He lived and he died without faith in Jesus Christ. He admitted in his autobiography, however, that while he was visiting a church, that he, what he believed had an over, to him was an overwhelming uh, religious experience. He said, my whole being was filled with a kind of heavenly joy far more intense than anything that I had ever known before. But the gospel created a problem for him. If he allowed himself to be influenced by it, he would have to change. His friends and family would think that he had lost his mind and maybe that intense joy was just something that he had simply imagined. So he concluded, and these are his words, I was too deeply embedded in the world to change course. He felt the emotions. 
His mind understood, but he wasn't willing to follow Jesus. Is it possible that some of us find ourselves in the same place? Jesus said, in order to follow him, we must die. We must take up our cross. Unfortunately, we've trivialized it. And something, when something goes wrong or, wrong or we face adversity, we say, oh, it's my cross to bear. But the cross that Jesus is talking about is a willingness to let go of my will and to live according to his will. It means a, not a physical death, but a spiritual death, one where we decide that his way, his life is primary if we're going to be Jesus' disciples. He is calling us to give up all. We must die to the old life, the sins, the selfish attitudes and ambitions, the old ideas of excess, success. Jesus is calling us to die to man's approval, to take on reproach and be crucified with him. So part of walking with him is being willing to know that whatever he asks us to do is for our benefit and blessing. The battle to die to self is not a one-time event. The Bible calls it a daily experience, dying daily. And every one of us understands that. It is a battle that I struggle with every day of my life. I know each one of you who truly is following Christ understands what I mean because self just wells up within us. We're constantly embattling the spirit. And Jesus is saying, submit and let me take over. Every day, it's a new day. It's a new day to take on the life that comes through the word of God, that comes through the spirit of God at work in us as we take in the, as it were, the water of life of Jesus Christ's life. And that's what he's calling us to do. Remember what Jesus said. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that do, does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in your name have cast out devils? In your name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. You see, we must let Jesus in. He's knocking at the door of our hearts and our minds, asking us to give our wills to him. He wants to come in and give us the power by his presence to live life according to his will. But we must die to self in order for that to happen. <clears throat> now there's a second aspect to this following Jesus when he's and it has to do with enduring. Jesus described this a little bit in Matthew 24 when he was talking about the end times and what those days would be like just prior to his return. He describes natural disasters, wars, and unbelievable persecution. He talks about false teachers and hard-heartedness of people. And he says in verse 22, and if those days were not cut short, no human being would be saved. It's pretty serious. There will be suffering. There will be persecution. But then in the next verse, he gives us this counsel. But he that shall endure to the end, the same will be saved. Hang in there. Keep trusting Jesus. Don't get discouraged by your own failures. Don't think that it's too difficult and give up. Endure, because Jesus has promised that he will give us all that we need. Our problem is that we, we're sometimes afraid to ask because we aren't always willing 
to do what he asked us to do. Jesus understood the way it would be. Because in the parable of the solar, he talked about the four different kinds of soil which represent how we would receive his word and his life. Some was hard, meaning there's strong resistance against him. Some soil is, was rocky, meaning there's big things in our lives that we're not willing to turn over to God. And others there were weeds, things that become more important to us and crowd out and choke out the power of God at work in our lives. But then there are many who will give their life to Jesus and accept everything that he offers. And then the fruit of the Spirit is at work. The life of Christ comes in and we have a life in Christ. These are the people that are going to be with him at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus asks us to endure to belong to him. Starting out is usually a very wonderful thing. It's a wonderful conversion experience. But then there are bumps in the road. There are days that it's hard. There's days that it's a struggle. There's a day, there are days when we're not willing to give in. It's when our flesh wants to do its thing. Or when someone ridicules. Endurance is staying committed to Jesus no matter what happens. So there it is, Jesus' message to us. First, he wants us to know who he is, the one who is there to save us, to redeem us. It is part of God's plan that he would take care of the penalty or the, the cost of what sin did to the human race. But more than that, he's offering his, us his life that we can be changed people, that we can be reformed, recreated, restored into the image that he created us to be to start with. Jesus was not just a good man. He was the God man. And what he did was to give us everything we need. The, th the second thing he asks us to do is to let go of ourselves and our own desires to do our thing in order that we be willing to do his thing and to endure till the end. My call to you this morning is to surrender. Respond to his abundant love. Let Jesus fill your heart. Let him be everything to you that you will allow him to be. God bless you as you face the struggles and the challenges of life. Let's sing together a commitment song, the hymn, Holy Thine.